let us start. Uh, we are discussing phase transitions, and um, we looked at um, the first order phase transitions in fluid systems through understood it through a phase uh, through a phase diagram in the in the pressure volume phase diagram through some a set of isotherms and I hope all of you if if not all of you some of you must have already gone through books and material on the internet to see a good three-dimensional picture of what I'm trying to drive over. I've, I've been uh, drawing over here. That three-dimensional picture gives you a kind of a hill structure uh, in which you see some kind of valleys and hills and so on. And that is what we are trying to draw, do over here uh, uh, on, in two dimensions. And we saw that the phase transitions take place like this, where many of these states over here, all of these states over here, which I have marked, are uh, not allowed either on account of a stability condition that the slope of a PV curve should be negative, so wherever it is positive, it is not allowed. And also on the basis that this part over here, these pressures, at these pressures, the, these parts are, have lower um, free energy than these parts. And over here, in this range, these, uh, uh, for, for in this range of pressure, these parts are, have lower uh, free energy than this part. And hence, what comes out is a curve which I drew a number of times um, will be a curve like this. This is the first order phase transition. And in this first order phase transition, there is a discontinuity in volume. System goes suddenly from a lower volume V0 to a higher volume V2. And uh, that phase transition occurs at a particular temperature, which we call P transition. And this is at this temperature T. So, um, at a temperature T, um, there is a pressure which, I, which we have called P with a subscript TR to show transition at which the system undergoes there is a phase transition, there is a transition to a phase. Phase transition. And this is from a phase on this side to a phase on this side. The phases are distinct over here. And that if you connect all of these points where phase transition occurs, then you will draw a region of this nature. And this region will not be allowed for the system to... Well, uh, 
this system, not that this will not be allowed, the system will exist in one stable phase on this side and another stable phase on this side of this parabolic region. Okay? And this will be a more condensed phase and this will be a less condensed phase. This will be a more condensed phase. On this side. So we have therefore, if you want, I can draw this again over here and we will say that there is this line and this line tells you a di distinction between uh, this part and this part. There is less condensed phase on this part. There is more condensed phase on this part. And then what is it that resides in between these two phases? So the question is, what is it that exists in this region over here? This region is the region of coexistence of phases. <coughs> so this is like this is like ice floating in water. The ice floating in water has already turned high water temperature to nearly zero degrees centigrade. Ice is at 0 degrees centigrade and ice and water coexist at a given pressure. Normally at the atmospheric pressure you have ice and water coexisting like that you see normally. <coughs> so reason of coexistence of phases, the two phases exist in this particular region. And as I said, this region ends at a point over here beyond which there is no way to distinguish between two phases. Um, you can start from here. Suppose this is liquid, this is gas. You start from here and you will have, you will be in a liquid phase. You can go up to here and you will still be in a liquid phase. But when you cross in this direction, you would not know when the system has become a gas. Okay? Beyond that, there is no distinction. There is no uh, separation, such a drastic separation between the two phases. All right. <clears throat> what do we have now as our agenda for uh, understanding the, the, the things that remain to understand in this particular phenomenon? One of the questions that remains, uh, that, that we need to see is, um, <coughs> Uh, we have already done that um, because uh, PT transition temperature P star and T star are related. We worked out in the last lecture a relation between them which was dP by dT equal to L over um, T times delta V. Okay? L is uh, the latent heat. T is uh, a temperature at which we measure this. And delta V is the, is the sudden difference, the large difference in volume, the discontinuity in volume. And this has come about because this was derived from the relationship that this is delta S over delta V. We need to spend a little time on understanding this uh, latent heat. Okay, and where it is used and why it is uh, so important. We need to understand that. We also need to see um, to, 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 uh, in the region of coexistence of phases, um, fractional 
communist fractional uh, composition of phases in this region of coexistence. They coexist, so we need to um, we need to see at, in what fraction uh, they exist at different values of volume. Uh, this, this is one point that we will address. The other point is uh, understanding latent heat. And um, okay, let us start with uh, um, the PT phase diagram. We have already seen this, and we. Uh, saw that pressure as a function of temperature goes like this. Okay, there is this curve. I have drawn this with some kind, some curvature. It could be different. It could be in my very first discussion on phase transitions when I introduced uh, uh, the subject of phase transition. I had drawn a curve more like um, a curve existing for different. Uh, allowing for different phases. This is more for water, H2O, where there's a uh, solid phase on this side and liquid phase on this side and gaseous phase on this side. So we have therefore a phase, and these lines are phase boundaries, uh, which, and, 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 and over here, I have a T and a P over here, that uh, pressure at different pressures, the transition takes place at a different temperature. Or at a different temperature, the transition takes place at a different pressure. And which transition takes place at what temperature is given in this uh, thing called phase diagram. That is the phase diagram that we have over here a very simplified version of it. And this, uh, for water, this actually goes and, and, and terminates in one particular point, which is the critical point I described as, again, as a dot in that picture. And this, uh, uh, as I, I think I did mention yesterday in, uh, in, in my last lecture, that this line has a negative slope over here Normally, it has also has a positive slope, but this negative slope uh, for water uh, essentially tells you that when ice melts, it uh, actually the, the it, it, its its uh, volume uh, or its density. Um, um, what happens? Ice has lower density, and therefore it floats at volume. Uh, increases. And that is a behavior which is quite different from the behavior of other substances. In other cases, you will have this perhaps also uh, with a positive slope. And this is the triple point at the triple point all three phases coexist. It is like this coexistence line that we have. Yeah. Uh, so you said that uh, at zero degrees, when we increase the temperature from zero degrees, the volume increases? No, no, no. Uh, as I said, uh, when uh, you say, OK, how, how, where, where do we take it from? The, when we freeze water, um, volume increases. OK? okay? <coughs> So, uh, uh, and therefore, density decreases. And uh, normally, in normal circumstances, when you reduce the temperature, volume decreases. Okay, in normally. In the case of water, it happens the other way around. When you freeze it, ice has a larger volume or larger density, um, uh, lower density, than, lower density than water. Therefore, it floats in water. And uh, that behavior is reflected by 
the opposite signature over here. This is what I wanted to say. Okay, now this is interesting because over here, which may again have a terminating point over here, but that uh, the pressure at which water boils is all over from here to here. Suppose we are uh, um, over here, this is perhaps the, you know, um, um, 100 degrees centigrade at which at normal atmospheric pressure where uh, water boils. If we increase the pressure, the value of uh, temperature at which it boils would uh, increase. So the water will boil at a very, uh, at higher temperature. And this is actually a property that is used in uh, power reactors, um, especially nuclear reactors, where you use water as coolant, as a substance which will generate heat or steam, which will go and turn the turbine. But then what you do, you know that uh, if you have uh, a, a, an enclosure in which there is this nuclear reaction taking place or something is heating up and, and, and water is getting heated, then this water would get very soon into gas and this gas will have a very large volume. The volume of water, volume, volume of vapors is much larger than volume of um, liquid water and therefore it will be very difficult to run it. And so what they do is actually keep this at very high pressure. And um, so, so let me, let me um, uh, draw the um, a rough sketch of how, what a nuclear plant nuclear plant does. So you have therefore a reactor vessel as you call it. <coughs> and you have in it uh, uh, nuclear fuel rods which when you uh, switch on will become critical and will start to have nuclear reactions and will start to generate enormous amount of heat. So what you do is you let water in from in this side and you take water out from this side to cool it, to take that heat out and use it somewhere. This is what the reactor does, right? You heat it up in this and you let water in, water or any other substance which can take heat from here and transport it somewhere else. It takes heat from here and it will take heat to some other place. When it does this, uh, you actually put it at a very high pressure. <clears throat> uh, high pressure. That value of, pressure of uh, the pressure is roughly 150 bar. 150 times as much as uh, the atmospheric pressure, as, as strong, as high pressure inside, as that, that much. Now because of which, water wouldn't boil even if uh, the, the, the temperature over here crosses 100 degrees centigrade. Normally, at this, the water inside is at uh, about uh, uh, 600 degrees centigrade and remains water. It doesn't evaporate. And then you, you take this water in somewhere and uh, uh, let it through a heat exchanger <laughs> And this heat exchanger is connected to a, another cycle of coolant system. So this is the primary coolant system. Primary coolant cycle. You take it through this and this is, uh, this has its own uh, uh, It 
when, when, when it passes through this, then the water flowing through this gets superheated. There is so much of heat coming in from here at this particular temperature, the water over there gets superheated. It actually turns into steam and that steam gets superheated. So this, this steam is not just at 100 degrees centigrade, it is at much larger uh, uh, temperature. And because it is a very high energy steam, therefore there is a very high amount of energy it contains that it can transfer to the turbine <coughs> that uh, runs to, to produce electricity. So it goes in and it uh, uh, turns a turbine. Uh, I don't know how to make a turbine, but you know, it, 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 it turns this turbine and um, electricity is produced over here and this steam is then brought back uh, again uh, to this cycle but this again is brought back through a this is secondary coolant cycle and this is this steam is condensed this is a condenser steam is condensed by another another cycle of water that takes water in from say a river or a, a, a sea and throws it back into river or sea. Okay, so water, water, uh, nuclear power plants are always near uh, a source of water that can take away the remaining amount of heat. So, over here, yeah. Uh, why did you condense it? Is that the question? Oh, but this steam is uh, superheated. And if you get to, if you, if you, uh, okay, the question is, uh, why do you want this to be kept at such a high pressure? And um, you will not be able to take water to this level of temperature if you do not put it at high pressure. Okay. So add, by put, putting it at high pressure, you are able to take the water to such a high temperature. And that water then flowing through this, and you see water has much less volume than steam. So that water you can easily float in a primary coolant cycle. And that goes in here, and uh, uh, through this exchanger, heat exchanger, it uh, exchanges heat, and the water that flows through this comes in contact with this uh, very high temperature water and uh, contact through, contact through, through, through some tube and uh, becomes a superheated steam at this point that goes in and turns turbines. And then gets condensed over here and gets pushed back over here. So why don't you directly send the water into the turbine from the reactor? Uh, why don't no, the, 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 that water will not have that much pressure. <coughs> you see, when you have, uh, when, you, when you take steam, uh, because of becoming gas, will have a much larger pressure than water would have. You will have a high temperature water, but it will not carry any pressure with it. Will not be able to exert any force on turbine. Okay? So this is, I, I was just, where was I? I was talking of this, how this uh, 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 increasing temperature, increasing pressure increases the boiling temperature. And that property is uh, used in this. I talked of uh, nuclear power plants. It could be also true in the case of normal power plants, normal thermal power plants, where again, you would like um, uh, temperatures to go up to very high values by increasing uh, the pressure. Okay, and also um, you um, note also the reverse part of it. If you have uh, normal, suppose this is the normal pressure and this is the normal boiling temperature of water, atmospheric pressure and atmospheric uh, and the 100 degrees centigrade over here. And if you are up 
in the hills where the pressure is low, then your uh, uh, boiling water boils at a much lower temperature. And because water boils at a much lower temperature, people find it difficult to cook things. <laughs> and that is how a pressure cooker was invented, so that you can have you can generate artificially generate higher pressure. And um, you know, uh, you, so this particular property is essentially what is commonly uh, observed around us. Um, and, ask, and, and then um, I would, after this, I would come to this description of latent heat. And this is actually a very important thing to um, talk about. There are some uh, interesting numbers that I have over here. We often take uh, water <clears throat> um, as, a, as a water is a very useful quantity. Uh, it has a very high uh, latent heat. Um, very high latent heat. In fact, the latent heat of vaporization of water is the highest among all the substances. And that is uh, very conveniently used in various places. So, latent heat of water, for, for latent heat of condensation of water is uh, 334 joule, uh, kilojoule. Uh, kilojoule per kilogram and um, which actually comes to about there are 18 um, grams per mole of uh, in of water so 18 18 kilograms per kilomole or 18 times 10 to the power minus 3 uh, kilograms per mole and uh, uh, latent heat of evaporation is very large, 2,260 kilojoule per kilogram, which is, uh, if you want, in another units, it is 40.67 times kilo, kilojoule per mole. This is, uh, 334 is uh, 6. 6.01 um, uh, kilojoule per mole. So what is it? Hmm. <coughs> okay, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So uh, when you are over here, if you have uh, um, it depends upon whether you are going this way or this way. So, um, if you are, uh, uh, if you are, if, if you are, if you have a solid on this side and liquid on this side, then this is uh, called. When you go this way, you got latent heat of fusion. This is what you are trying to say, right? Yes. Latent heat of fusion, and. Um, if you um, evaporation is uh, when you have liquid on this side and gas on this side, then you go this way and it is evaporation. Yes, true. So this is actually, uh, if you like, I could put it as fusion if this is what you are familiar with. Okay, yeah? Fusion is melting, right? So it is the same thing, which way, which, whichever way you go, whether you go this way or this way, the amount of latent heat is the same. Sorry? Condensation. Is it not different than fusion? Yeah. Condensation, condensation could be used both. The word condensation could be used both here and here both in condensing gas into liquid or liquid into solid. Whereas uh, when solid goes into liquid, it is melting. And melting is called fusion also. 
or if you go from liquid to solid, it's called solidification. Okay? It is melting, yeah. Or solidification, if you like. Okay, no, this curve is the phase transition. This curve can that this is this is this was indeed you are right. I drew it for uh, only this kind of phase transition, but a similar phase transition would exist <coughs> like this. So I should have been okay. I should have drawn it over here, right? I should have said that here you will have latent heat of condensation or uh, fusion, latent heat of uh, fusion or uh, uh, solidification or on this side I would have written heat of uh, evaporation or uh, condensation. Okay? In this in this particular case? Yes sir. Yeah, yeah this is this is true. Right? So at a higher pressure you require lesser temperature Right, right. This is this is typical of water. If, if you are talking about water, yes. Okay, so 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 uh, I'm trying to give you these numbers not for any particular uh, reason. You see, uh, latent heat is something again which we come across so much in our life. Um, our body, uh, body school themselves by. A process of uh, using latent heat. We, our sweating is um, essentially uh, evaporation and the evaporation takes away so much heat out of the body. So whenever there is an evaporation, so much of heat is taken away by the, by the, by the, quantity, by the thing that evaporates. So a sweating evaporation takes away so much heat you use desert coolers in your um, rooms and you, industrial cooling also uses that. In places you will find industrial coolant towers of uh, some very uh, huge towers like this. And in these towers you have uh, all the heat that goes out, you convert that by sprinkling water over the pipes that contain uh, heat and that uh, turns into steam and takes it out and that conversion of water, sprayed water into steam uh, takes away a lot of heat from the hot water that they want to cool down. So this, 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 this is how uh, this takes place or um, the, the, the way you uh, Cooling process itself is something that I will, act, I think, will 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 talk about in a minute. I want to give you a few, um, a, a very interesting uh, set of numbers that will um, describe how significant water's properties are. So I'm looking at over here in terms of numbers, in terms of numbers. <clears throat> Um, uh, energy, heat energy Q required to, um, and I'm looking at four processes, melting 100 grams of uh, lead. Vaporizing, some people are speaking. He's quiet. Vaporizing 100 grams of lead. Um, melting 100 grams of H2O. And comparing these, vaporizing hundred mm -hmm. 
100 grams of H2O. Um, so I will have actually the, in the case of lead, the melting temperature of lead is uh, uh, 700 K. Boiling temperature of lead uh, is uh, 2022 Kelvin, and this is at atmospheric pressure, normal atmospheric pressure. <coughs> Melting uh, temperature of H2O <coughs> is uh, 273, of course, and boiling temperature of H2O is 373 Kelvin. So water boils at a much lower temperature, freezes at uh, a much lower temperature, and, um, but lead uh, freezes at uh, 700 Kelvin and uh, vaporizes uh, at 2022 Kelvin. Uh, latent heat of melting of lead is uh, 4.77 kilojoule per mole. And latent heat of uh, boiling or evaporation uh, is 178 uh, kilojoule or more. And 100 gram of, uh, we also note that 100 grams of lead is equal to 100 grams divided by 207.2 uh, gram per mole that you have for, 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 for uh, lead. <coughs> The latent heat of vaporize, uh, of melting I have already written 334. I already have those numbers over there. Um, and um, I will put this number in the form of mole also. Uh, these are in the form of uh, 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 moles. I will put them in the form of grams also. So latent heat of melting is uh, 6 uh, kilojoule per mole and latent heat of uh, evaporation of water is 40.66 kilojoule per mole. So where are we then with these numbers? Quickly, for lead, The heat required to melt a hundred grams, the number A. So, <clears throat> heat required to melt hundred grams of lead is uh, equal to um, one hundred grams multiplied by one over two hundred seven point two grams per mole multiplied by four point seven seven. Uh, kilojoule and this comes out to be uh, 2.3 kilojoule. The heat required to vaporize lead, 100 grams of lead, so 100 grams multiplied by 1 over 207.2 multiplied by 178 kilojoules and that comes out to be uh, 85.9 kilojoules. You can do a similar exercise and you will see that for QM, for water, for H2O, QM 
is uh, 33.3 kilojoule and Q uh, vaporization is uh, 400 grams again is 226 kilojoule. Interesting is it is it not that you know um, melting and um, evaporation of water takes much more heat than melting and evaporation of lead. This is something that is actually shows the importance of water. Water can, has so much capacity to, to, to carry heat with it um, when it is properly used. This was uh, an important, um, I thought, indicator of the importance of this thing. I would, I would, um, next, okay, and also in the question of uh, evaporation, uh, Evaporation is a process. I know that my phone is off. So somebody is following my practice. Hmm? Okay. Evaporation is um, or act of act, act of uh, vaporization. Uh, usually this uh, act of vaporization is something which is normally used even in situations where you want to get down to um, a billionth of a Kelvin, as low temperature as, as this. And which is actually, in the case of evaporation of water, if you have a, a pot of water before you, it evaporates uh, because um, in, at a particular temperature, At a particular temperature, water molecules will have different velocities. They will have uh, a range of a range of velocities. <coughs> and range of velocities means that they will have a range of kinetic energies. And uh, because they have this range of kinetic energies, some of them, of course, will, will, have, will be faster than the others, will have a higher uh, um, kinetic energy than the others. And uh, when they are inside, they will continuously bump against each other and try and exchange uh, momentum and kinetic energy with respect to each other. But when they are near the surface, those which have higher kinetic energy will escape. And uh, those which escape with higher kinetic energy cause a lowering of temperature of the rest of the body because um, the, the, the molecules with higher higher <clears throat> kinetic energy uh, escape from surface and because they go away there is that much less amount of energy in the system and therefore um, uh, lowering the temperature of the remaining So this is what we do when we have a hot cup of tea and you want to cool it down, we actually blow on it. And when we blow on it, we try and, um, try and um, 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 assist, aid some of the molecules which are at the surface, higher energy molecules to go away. And that is the process by which cooling takes place. Now this process is so trivial, we all understand this. 
But this is also understood, this is also very useful in obtaining low temperatures even in very different situations. At very, very low temperatures in the range of uh, uh, milli or uh, even smaller um, range of smaller values of milli Kelvin or smaller values of temperature where the atoms are nearly, nearly frozen. Over there, what you do is that you find ways of somehow kicking out atoms with a larger velocity. If you can somehow kick out atoms with a larger velocity, you actually cool down your system. So, you, when I say they have a range of velocities, usually the velocities have a distribution like this. This is, the, this is called the Maxwellian distribution of velocities. Near, I'm sorry? Sorry? Is it called Boltzmann? Yes, also. <laughs> okay, so good, good. Uh, I agree with you, this is also called Boltzmann, but this is actually before Boltzmann. Maxwell was many, many decades before Boltzmann. So the poor fellow also proposed this, so we should not snatch away the credit from him, you know. So, uh, giving him due credit, this is Maxwellian distribution of velocities. <laughs> okay, so Maxwellian distribution of velocities. And this is uh, a, actually a uh, distribution in which you have uh, number of particles over here and the velocities on this side, um, V on this side. And there will be, majority of the particle will have this, this velocity nearly zero or whatever because velocity is a vector quantity so it will have this side on this side going on this side on that side. <coughs> but there will be uh, a large number of particles. So the particles over here have the highest velocity in this side and particles over here have the highest velocity going on that side. And a process of cooling actually amounts to uh, somehow kicking out so those particles from the system. If you kick them out, you have lesser number of particles, particles with lesser number of average, this will reduce, uh, to reduce uh, average speed. And if you reduce average speed, you reduce average kinetic energy, you reduce also the internal energy U. And because you reduce internal energy, therefore you reduce temperature T. So as I, 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 was, I was specifically mentioning this because this is a process that is used even in very sophisticated ways of getting into um, 10 to the power minus 9 Kelvin, for example, uh, where people design such methods by which optically they throw out those atoms which have higher velocities, which would be the same thing that we do over here. Uh, okay. Now we have a couple of, what do we have on our agenda list? Um, we have four more lectures to go after this, right? Four more lectures to go? Okay, they keep the count, you see. Uh, four more lectures to go after this. <laughs> Preparation? Yes, sir. 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 Y
Why do you expect क्या होंगे? क्या करते हैं? सिलेबस पहले खत्म करा के फिर क्या करते हैं? सिलेबस पहले खत्म करा के रिवाइज वगैरह अच्छा ये कह रहे हैं सिलेबस पहले खत्म करवा के रिवाइज करवाते हैं और फिर ट्यूशन सेंटर में बिठाते हैं फिर वहाँ इम्तिहानों की तैयारियाँ करवाते हैं हैं क्वेश्चंस के सवाल के जवाब रटवाते हैं ऑल ऑफ दोज ओल्ड थिंग्स हैं गुड तो अभी आप लोग लंच नहीं आए हैं ये आ गए हैं सिलेबस से क्या मतलब है जो मैंने क्लासरूम में पढ़ाया वो सब होगा अगर मेरी जो मेरी जो सिलेबस जो मैंने शुरू में दिया था उसके कुछ टॉपिक्स अगर रह गए हैं रह जाएंगे कुछ क्योंकि मैं उनको चेंज करूंगा किसी तरह अगले चार लेक्चर्स में तो इस वजह से वो तो नहीं होंगे लेकिन जो मैं पढ़ाऊंगा क्लासरूम में दैट वुड बी द सिलेबस वो सारा तो ये नहीं होता ये नहीं होता ये नहीं कर सकते नहीं ये तो नहीं हो सकता ना बड़ी 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 ख्वाहिशात हैं आप लोगों तो खराब नहीं होना चाहिए या आप पढ़ लें दैट इज अच्छा चार घंटा बहुत ज्यादा है बहुत से लोग तो वक्त पे छोड़ते भी नहीं पेपर कहते हैं जी हमें और वक्त चाहिए आप कह रहे चार घंटे कम है नहीं आप आप दो बातें अलग अलग कर रहे हैं आप कह रहे हैं चार घंटे बहुत ज्यादा हैं फिर कह रहे हैं कि चार घंटे बहुत कम है हाँ आपको पता है कि आपका पेपर शुरू में तो टाइम टेबल में नहीं था बाद में आया तो मालूम हुआ कि शाम चार बजे से शाम रात आठ बजे तक है सुबह आठ बजे तक कर देते हैं इसको अब तो चेहरे पे हवाइया उड़ गई आप लोगों की ये ये सो शाम चार बजे से शाम आठ बजे तक है आपका पेपर उसके बाद आप लोगों को नींद की इतनी ज़रूरत होगी कि आप जाना चाहेंगे आराम की ज़रूरत होगी आप लोगों आई विल डिसाइड दैट लेटर आई विल डिसाइड दैट लेटर क्या कर दें वो ये बात कर रहे थे मैंने कहा कि वो तो अभी डिसाइड करेंगे मेरा ख्याल में नहीं होगा वो ज़रूरत नहीं पड़ेगी उसकी ज़रूरत नहीं पड़ेगी देखिए मैंने इस दफ़ा आप लोगों के टेस्ट तो काफ़ी लिए ना और उन टेस्ट की एवरेजेस बहुत अच्छी हैं अब तक तो अच्छी है मुझे पता नहीं पिछला टेस्ट आप लोगों ने कैसे किया मैंने देखा नहीं मगर उससे पहले के टेस्ट के रिजल्ट देख तो मैं खासा खुश हुआ था कि अच्छी अच्छा हाँ मीन वहाँ पे लेकिन ये 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 जो आप में से बहुत से लोग ऐसे हैं कि जिनके स्कोर्स बहुत अच्छे हैं और बाकी लोग जो हैं वो भी उनके स्कोर भी अब अच्छे होते जा रहे हैं जो मैं देख रहा हूँ तो आई थिंक आई थिंक दिस इज गोइंग टू बी और फिर बाकी जो आपके असाइनमेंट्स के ग्रेड्स और आपके वो सारे जो हैं वो बहुत मेरा ख्याल में कोई बहुत ख़राब सूरत नहीं है अलार्मिंग सिचुएशन नहीं है तो बस आप तैयारी ठीक करें तो ठीक होगा एनीवे सो इन द नेक्स्ट फोर लेक्चर्स आई वुड लाइक टू कवर आई हैव ए कपल ऑफ टॉपिक्स दैट आई नीडेड टू कवर एक तो ये कि इस डिस्कशन में फेस ट्रांसिशन के डिस्कशन में एक दो छोटे से इश्यूज हैं विच होपफुली विल बी कवर टुडे एंड देन देर इज़ वन टॉपिक विच इज इंटरेस्टिंग विच एक्चुअली शुड बी नोन टू एनी बडी हुज स्टडीड थर्मोडाइनिक्स के ऑस्मोटिक प्रेशर्स क्या होते हैं और 
osmosis ka phenomenon kya hota hai we will talk of that and um, then i intend to take you to uh, through some elementary statistical mechanics i will uh, i have already introduced uh, probabilities before you and i have already already introduced some elementary concepts what i will do is i will take on from there and do uh, some sections of statistical mechanics which are easily doable and if you can do that we will be um, we will have a better idea of of thermodynamics than uh, we would otherwise have so in the next uh, four lectures or at least three and a half lectures you uh, ex would expect to get uh, introduction to statistical mechanics all right <clears throat> So in the case of uh, Clausius Clapeyron equation which you actually have written on that side dp by dt equal to uh, I wrote here there l I will write over here delta h over t times delta v and you will notice that by writing these numbers h and v these quantities h and v in molar um way doesn't really change the situation because uh, uh you divide both numerator and denominator by uh, the number of moles to get molar quantities so we can always write them in that particular form now the if you have a liquid vapor transition then uh um, delta v which is uh, v vapor minus v liquid is actually nearly v vapor because all the moles have expanded to such a large volume that the molar volume uh, of vapors is very large compared to the molar volume of the liquid and um this could be this vapor could be the volume could be taken as uh, a part of the satisfying ideal gas equation so that we could write this as r times t over p <coughs> approximately we could regard vapor that we had then had now as an ideal gas <clears throat> so we therefore have uh, uh, this equation delta sorry um dp by equal to we will have uh, delta h which will be we should put a small v down there to show this is the enthalpy or the late, uh, this divided by t will be latent heat no, this will be latent heat latent heat of evaporation and um, divided by temperature times v and v will be we will write that so it will be r times t squared and then p on top <coughs> transition nahi hote good question so he is he is saying that why can you use ideal gas equation when we know that there are no phase transitions in the ideal gas system a very valid question 
the point is that we are not over here looking at phase transition in this case. What we're looking at is the is the thing that if that some liquid has transformed itself into a gas, and now we have that gas, and that gas is uh, although this equation certainly is, would be cannot be derived from an ideal gas equation, right? But because this vapor is now has been obtained, we can approximate this pressure volume uh, relationship to be that of an ideal gas. Okay? So we write it in this form and therefore then we distribute P and T on the two sides as we normally do. We will say dP over P is equal to uh, delta HV will be a constant thing divided by R will be a constant thing and then we have Oh, oh yes, okay. And we bring dt from this side to this side and we divide by t squared. So we therefore now have an equation in which we have all pressure dependence on one side, all temperature dependence on the other side. And we can then do the integration. If we do the integration, we can actually write this equation also as d log p equal to delta h v divided by r times um, uh, I would um, write this as uh, um, d of uh, um, 1 over t minus d of minus 1 over t. Okay? Right? So d of minus 1 over t will be uh, minus sign will cancel this minus sign will become minus t squared and then dt. So this is what it is. And because of which one should be able to write I am going from bottom of the board to the top of the board from here one can write log p, therefore, by integrating, this is, I'm now integrating, integrating this equation, and integrating this equation, there are two kinds of integrations, definite integrals and indefinite integrals, so this particular thing could be taken as indefinite integration. Log p is equal to delta h v over r times minus 1 over t plus constant constant of integration okay I know because if I differentiated this quantity I will get this without the integration sign uh, this is the expression or I could actually do this integration in a um, as a definite integral by going from pressure P naught to P some initial pressure to a pressure P and from some temperature T naught to T if I did this I would get log of P uh, over P naught is equal to D H V over R I met a few students the other day um, on uh, Monday and they complained that I write all of this mathematics without giving any physical concept behind. So, <laughs> huh? so I was very disappointed with myself. But then now, I, then I told them to stop me wherever they think I am, my mathematics is very obscure or I'm not being clear in conveying concepts. And unless you stop me, unless you ask me, unless you say, do this again, show this again, explain this again, I would not know where I'm saying things very trivial or where I'm saying things very obscure. So, so you were there, one of them. So no 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 problem today so far good good 
आई एम वेरी हैप्पी क्या हुआ क्यों नहीं किया कर सकते थे बिल्कुल कर सकते थे सो लेट मी वो ही सेइंग व्हाई डोंट व्हाई डिंट यू डू द इंटीग्रेशन डायरेक्टली सो ओके सो वी डू द इंटीग्रेशन डायरेक्टली एंड हेयर वी से दिस इंटीग्रेशन विल गिव यू लॉग पी लॉग ऑफ पी ओवर पी नॉट इक्वल टू डेल्टा एच वी ओवर आर times um minus uh 1 over t minus 1 over t not uh even in spite in spite of this in spite of this in spite of this okay yeah 1 over t not minus 1 over t okay good so i will have this expression and this expression i can then Uh, write as p. I will take exponentials on both the sides, and then rearrange, and I will get p equal to p naught exponential of. And um, let me take a minus sign out. What delta h v over r one over t minus one over t naught. So. so in the 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 liquid vapor transition uh transition occurring at a particular temperature can be related to transition temperatures um t not p not can be related to uh transition temperatures at any other temperature of pressure question no good okay and um <coughs> the uh these are all these this is these these are transition temperatures right and transition pressures so what i said was that transition temperatures and pressures at one point one set of transition temperature and pressure can be related to another set of transition temperature and pressure so if you know that water boils at, at atmospheric pressure at 100 degrees centigrade then you can know from this relationship uh the 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 um 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 boiling um temperature at another pressure okay <clears throat> i would then go on to um go back to actually this diagram and this question that i wrote over here and um i have actually two questions over here in this diagram i have two questions number 1 where would i draw this line we know that this is the line where uh, in our mu uh, mu at this point is the same as mu at this point so uh, that is one way of trying to of knowing where this thing would exist but we can also use this same particular property to find a way to determine where would this line come and um, <coughs> the line would come at a point you know that d mu is v um, times dp minus s times dt this comes in from the equation for g because we know that mu is mo molar g
increase yourself. Just keep this in mind. I was really disappointed yesterday when I saw this happening. And I just saw that this was going to start again. Those of you who think this was a nice civilized thing to do, please raise your hand. No. So even those who did this don't regard this to be a civilized thing to do. So, not a good thing. Okay. So maybe I will stop over here, just for the last one, and I will take it up the remaining things uh, in the next lecture.